Pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in your presence. Lord, as we gather for worship, we ask that you would search our hearts. Lord, we know the power of your word, and we know what it can reveal within us, and we also know what it can reveal about you. And so may our eyes be opened today. Lord, may we not only know your truth, but live your truth as we hear this word. So God, we are grateful. Be with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's great to see you this morning, church. My name is Han. If you didn't know, uh, I'm uh, normally in the Great Hall uh, on the other side of campus uh, leading worship, but today I have such a joy to to share the word of God with you. And every time I'm in the sanctuary, uh, I just have this peace and this joy uh, knowing that that God's people are here to worship. It is so great to be here with you. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm still kind of reeling from Easter uh, this year, and I can't help but think that this is just the beginning of something beautiful that God is about to do, uh, not only uh, within these walls, but also in our city as well. Uh, So if you are joining us for the first time, I wanna welcome you to our church here at Park Cities. Uh, If you are here for the first time um, in a long time, I wanna welcome you back. Uh, Pastor Jeff uh, uh, mentioned to the staff that he had ran into uh, several families who told him, we're back after not having been here for years. And so if that is you, we wanna welcome you back to church. Uh, We're so happy that you are here. Now, if you're in that boat, we've been in this series called The Gospel According to Jesus, which is essentially a series through the book of Matthew. And you know, last week's message on anxiety and worry was one that I think impacts every single human soul. I mean, who hasn't ever worried or have been anxious about anything? Uh, But it really highlighted the struggle of the human soul that that resides in this fallen world. Well, as we continue on in this line of thinking, today we'll be looking at the issue of anger. And to see what Jesus said about this, we'll be camping out in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, and also in verses 38 through 42 of the same chapter. So go ahead, if you have your Bibles, turn to that passage, and and while you're doing that, I want to talk a little bit about anger, because anger is not just something that a few people just struggle with. It's a real human emotion that we all experience in various degrees and intensities, In a national poll done by NPR, uh, it was revealed that 85% of people said that Americans are angrier today compared with a generation ago. In the same poll, we learn that 91% of those respondents said that they feel people are more likely to express that anger on social media than they are in person. I don't know about you, but I think these two statistics are somewhat related. The truth is there are things in our lives that point to the anger that resides deep beneath our souls. And our inability to identify the signs of anger only further the relational gaps that are deepened when the only way we know how to connect with people is with our social media accounts. Well, my message this morning is my plea with you, church, to search your own heart today as we see what Jesus says about anger. Now, I say this because I wouldn't consider myself a particularly angry person. I don't know, maybe that's what you think, but really, I'm not. And perhaps maybe you don't think of yourself that way either. But when I measured my own perspective of myself through the lens of Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, in verses 38 through 42, to be honest with you, if I could be real with you, church, I have reason to pause. Why is this message so vital for every single person in this room? Because while we all might have different temperaments, we live in a very angry world. If that poll statistic I shared with you is not convincing enough, just go online, watch the news, sit through rush hour traffic, am I right? 
So in looking at this passage from a 30,000 foot view, starting in verse 21 of chapter five, we are entering into what is known as the six antitheses. That is six oppositional, oppositional statements. This is because we're gonna see Jesus saying, you have heard it said, and then offer a different word. Well, Jesus in these statements, he's not contradicting the law, rather he is making wider applications and interpreting the law. Jesus is essentially taking the law further. As we'll see in verse 21, for example, we see that Jesus isn't saying that the law of not to murder is wrong, but he's getting deeper into the heart of the emotions of hate. More specifically, he's contradicting the ways in which the Pharisees led others with this law. Now, as believers, we need to understand our anger because we need to be able to point to a better way. And we'll be able to do that through our passage today because in our passage, what Jesus essentially does is he teaches against the ways of the Pharisees by showing us a better way when it comes to our anger. So, so let's start reading in verses 21 and 22. This is what Jesus said. Hear the word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So here I believe Jesus is saying, instead of talking down about people, talk up. Instead of talking down about people, let's talk up. We see that oftentimes the anger can be expressed with words. And the word used in verse 22 in the Greek is the word raka. And raka is translated directly as you fool or you good for nothing. But the word is frankly a little bit difficult to fully translate because the word communicates more of a tone of a voice and an attitude of the person speaking it. Raka is a word that is spoken to another person, not only to insult, but out of arrogant contempt. This is a person who thinks they're bigger than they really are. This is a strong word to utter towards someone. And for those who know the language, they would immediately know and feel how the person speaking it feels. But, you know, we have words like this in the English language, don't we? Words, when spoken, communicate not only a thought, but a feeling of anger as well. But not just any anger, but one that is arrogant and belittling. So we're getting very specific here. Words or phrases like, excuse me, I'm not done talking. You can, you can include the hands if you want, right? That's just bonus. I'm not done talking. Or, or how about this one? Who do you think you are? Do you hear the arrogance there? Do you, see, do you hear the feel, the feel of anger in that and the condensation? That, that there's anger and arrogance in that. Now, I'm not saying that being angry is a sin, and I don't think Jesus is saying this either. Rather, that in the expression of anger, there is the breaking of the law. And in this case, it is in the words that come out of our mouths. Jesus also said in Matthew 15, 11, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Words expressed in anger are not just a way that we express ourselves. It is a way that we condemn ourselves and others that leave us, quite frankly, broken. Talking down to someone isn't just something we do because we're angry but it's something that we do because we've been offended. So I understand. But it's also something that we do because perhaps we're insecure. Now what's at the root of maybe you talking down to someone? Because we've all done it, myself included. Our words about a person say a lot about how we feel about that person, but it also says a lot, as believers, about the journey we need to take in order to get to a place where we can genuinely talk up about them, 
Church, that is our goal. We want to be in a position. We want to be found talking up about people. Amen? This is a place where despite what people have done to us or what they've done, and perhaps you have someone in mind when, as I'm talking about this, this is a place despite what they've done to us, we can be an encouragement to them. And so may this be our goal as Christ followers, to get to that point. Instead of ignoring that anger within us, uh, to, to, to get to a place where we can genuinely talk up about them. This is our goal as Christ followers. Now that's a difficult journey to take. I suppose, depending on the severity of the offense, right? But this is how we fight our, our battles. We, we pray and we ask God, help me to understand. Help me to understand so that the words that come out of my mouth are full of grace and full of mercy and love towards this person. Well, when it comes to anger, there's another way that Jesus teaches against the way the Pharisees. He taught that instead of religious duty, we need to reconcile. Let's take a look at verses 23 through 26. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with them to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. So Jesus here is saying that while your worship to him is important, your relational thorns matter as well. In fact, it matters enough that it needs to be settled before you come to worship. And in putting this in context, this meant that a person who came into the temple to offer sacrifices at the altar, and, and of course Jesus' original audience most likely lived a considerable uh, distance away from Jerusalem, they would have to leave their offering and travel days to reconcile with that person. And don't miss that detail, church. Reconciling with someone in these days wasn't as easy as pulling out your phone and saying, my bad. I apologize, I'm sorry. But it took a journey of several days outside the walls of the temple. Jewish teachers of the day were all about the ministry that happened in the temple. But Jesus was more concerned with ministry that happened outside of those walls. And I think that's where our hearts need to be as well. Again, Jesus is not teaching against the law but the way in which it had been interpreted by the Pharisees at the time. Jesus is saying that it's more important to reconcile with a person than performing a religious duty. And this is what it was all about for the Pharisees, religious duty. You know, this is something that I've been guilty of many times and something I've had to repent of many times. And I think ministers and those perhaps active in the church can be most susceptible of this to think of only of my duty, but neglect the people who are serving alongside me, and more importantly, the people I'm actually serving. You know, I love Martin Buber's classic book. He has a book entitled, I and Thou. And it's a book that essentially explains that all our godly relationships bring us into a relationship with God. You know, Buber tells us that people tend to view relationships uh, with others through two lenses. There are really two types of relationships. There's the it, I-it relationship and the I-thou relationship. Let me explain. The I-it relationship is us treating people as a means to an end. So if things don't go our way, let's say in serving, we get short with people. Maybe we get impatient with them. Maybe we lose it. The I-thou relationship is us treating people as unique souls. No matter what happens in our serving the Lord, we're treating people as unique souls created in the image of God. The I-it relationship says, never mind connecting with the people that we serve alongside. Let's just get the job done. Let's get our figures up. Let's get our numbers up. Let's just make sure we have a good event. And we're just going to forget about the people that we're serving alongside. I-thou says... 
I want to make sure that my brother and I are reconciled before we serve together. There's a difference. And Bieber said in his book, all real life is meeting. In other words, when we meet with people and connect with them, where we really listen and seek to understand them, we get a glimpse of the way God sees us. And for these Pharisees in Jesus' time, I imagine that their ministry was driven primarily by duty, which is not a bad thing. It's great to serve with a sense of duty. Uh, frankly, I think we need more of that. But the Pharisees were doing that at the expense of the deep relationships that needed to happen during this time, which is why I believe Jesus felt the need to mention this in his sermon. The fact is, when it comes to our ministry to people, when we place reconciliation over religious duty, what we're essentially doing is we're choosing to place love over the actual work. If you remember this passage, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, it speaks of this. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So church, before coming into the sanctuary next week, who do you need to reconcile with? I would guess that even before asking that question and perhaps even before starting in on this message, Perhaps you already had a person in mind. Maybe that person that you just can't stand. You, you see their names on paper and your blood just boils. It's, it's that person in your life that you can't stand. Perhaps some emails or phone calls need to be sent out this week. Perhaps that's where, you're, perhaps that's where the Lord is leading you. Church, ask the Lord this week what you can say to this person and see what God does in that relationship. Take the step of obedience to reconcile and and see what God does in that relationship. And that is my prayer for you. That That this week would be the week of reconciliation. That when you come to worship on Sunday, that you can come with a testimony in your mouth and a heart that is rejoicing over the reconciliation that happened. Now, I have so much more to say on this point, but for now, I I want you to keep in mind this idea of reconciliation before we move on, because it will help us land uh, this message in the end. So how else does Jesus address dealing with anger? Let's look now at verses 38 through 42. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So from this passage, we see Jesus is encouraging us in this way. He's saying, instead of losing it, love. You know, these verses point to Jesus' perspective on retaliation, the issue of retaliation. And he uses some real life examples to point out how we should deal with the temptation to do so. For example, that example with uh, the uh, slap on the right cheek is a big one. This is essentially a backhand slap. I mean, think about the, if I'm facing a person and I'm using my right hand to slap, their right cheek is on this side, so this is a backhand slap, which is so much more offensive than an open hand slap. And, and in this context, and perhaps even in our context, how easy would it be for a person to lose it in anger if this happened to them? 
And how about that example of letting the person sue you to take your cloak or coat as well as your tunic? Well, also with this, Jewish law actually prevents a person from taking a person's coat if they sue to take away their their shirt. No matter what, a person would be protected from having their coat taken away because it was a more essential piece of clothing because it would keep them warm, uh, and and, and uh, especially in those um, cold nights, it doubled as a blanket. So what does this say about about Jesus' dealing with anger? He's saying, do more than the courts allowed and give that person your coat also. Now, church, this isn't just blindly taking a beating or just holding the door open for someone to walk all over you in the name of just being nonviolent. Now, if you are in a relationship like that, my prayer is that you would get out of that relationship I'm talking about abusive relationships. My prayer is that you would get the help that you need. And here at Park Cities, we, we want to do that. My prayer is that you would be wise and leave. But, you know, I'm not talking about being walked over. And what I'm talking about here is, is love, the way of Jesus. The kind of love that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. In fact, immediately after this teaching, Jesus teaches us to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute in verse 44. Boy, how hard is that to do, church? You know, instead of expressing your anger by retaliation, perhaps there is someone in your life that you could show your love to. You know, you might have heard the saying, hurt people hurt people. I would imagine that the hurt we receive from others comes from a place of hurt. So oftentimes the reason it's so hard to respond with love when you've been hurt is because we don't take time to see our offenders hurt. Again, who could you show your love towards this week? Church, would you take some time to not only identify those who have hurt you, if you haven't already, but also ask God to reveal to you their hurts as well. And my hope and prayer is that that would lead you to a place where you can show not only love, but grace and understanding. And we've talked a lot about anger today. And that is, in fact, what our passage is about. But I believe that Jesus is doing more than just advocating for nonviolence. If Jesus' teaching was just about dealing with our anger, I don't think he would be really pointing us towards love. For example, God didn't just deal with his anger when it came to our sin, he died for sinners like us. And praise God for that. Romans 5, 6 through 11 tells us, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Praise God for that. In everything, Jesus points us to love because it's not just about how we behave, but whether there's reconciliation or not. So in light of the issue of anger, here's my landing point that encompasses everything that I've shared with you today. And this is the point I wanna make to you. Anger reveals the need for reconciliation with others and with God. And church, maybe there's anger in your heart today. Maybe you didn't know until you came in today. Maybe there's anger in your heart and you didn't realize there was. But as you continue to dig deep and as as the Holy Spirit continue to move in you, maybe maybe you're starting to see the anger bubbling beneath you. My prayer is that we would not only deal with that anger, but that we would seek reconciliation with the people that have caused that or with God himself. Maybe you're angry at God today for some reason. Maybe you ought to get to know him. You know, we talked about anger today, but today's message is essentially about reconciliation. 
Anger is a real and tangible emotion that we all experience in various degrees, but to ignore it or to indulge in it sets us on a course to destroy our relationships. Well, in our continued pursuit towards reconciliation with one another and with the Lord, I can't think of a better act of worship that we can do right now to help with this than the Lord's Supper. And this is what the Lord's Supper is all about. By remembering Christ and his sacrifice, we are doing the work of reconciliation with those in the body as well. And and 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17 tells us, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So let's share in the Lord's Supper, knowing that God sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty for our sin so that we could be reconciled to one another and to himself. So next to you, you might see elements. And so I wanna encourage you to, to bring out your elements. And as you do so, you'll remember that the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples. And they shared a meal together in community. And essentially, church, this is what happened. Jesus took the bread and he said, take, eat, this is my body. So likewise, let's take and eat as we remember Christ's body broken for us. Then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So likewise, let's take and drink as we remember Christ's blood shed for us, that we might be reconciled with the Lord. Let's drink together. As I mentioned earlier, anger is an emotion that we all feel. And if today, by seeing what anger lies within us, if you see the need for reconciliation between you and the Lord, my prayer is that we would come to know him And then just like in any relationship, that we would be able to understand his heart. If you don't know Jesus today and you don't have a relationship with him, I want to invite you to know him. I want to invite you to know him, not just to deal with your anger, but to be reconciled with him. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And he resurrected on the third day, proving that he was God, all for the sake of reconciliation with our Heavenly Father. If you want to know more about that, we'd love to talk to you. We want to pray with you. If you're a believer and there's a need for reconciliation with someone this week, like I said earlier, I I really hope that this would be the week of reconciliation for you. And when you come to church on Sunday, then there'll be joy in your heart because of that. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be here. Your word is powerful and it reveals so much about our hearts, what lies beneath our hearts. And Lord, it says a lot about who you are 
And so, Lord, I pray that at the end, in the end, we'll, we'll be able to reconcile with you as we continue our journey with you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't just deal with your anger towards sin. But, Lord, you died for us. We are so grateful. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.